Jean Milne, an elderly spinster who lived on her own in Elm Grove, a mansion house in Broughty Ferry near Dundee, was murdered. She was found on Sunday the 3rd of November 1912. It was particularly brutal and bloody, and we know that because we have details in the form of police statements of what they found when they entered Elm Grove. On making examination, I found that she was all blood on the top of her head and her face was much swollen. She was lying on her right side, her left arm lying across her right arm. A metal knob of a poker produced was found underneath some withered bay branches lying at the side of the wall beside the left side of the stair. The carving fork produced was found on the floor near the body. The prongs and bone handle of the fork were bloodstained. There were 20 punctures on the back, representing 10 stabs, eight punctures representing four stabs on the right breast, two punctures representing one stab on the left breast, just over the heart, and two punctures on the right wrist, representing one stab. Following the discovery of the body, the Broughty Ferry Police start looking for possible leads as to who might have murdered Jean Milne. The following is taken from Chief Constable John Howard Semple's statement from the evidence files in the case against the main suspect, a man called Charles Warner. If you want to read the files as you listen to the podcast, you'll find links on the Leverhulme Research Centre for Forensic Science at the University of Dundee's website. Semple's statement starts on page 119. Amongst the deceased's correspondence, we found a number of letters bearing London addresses, with the writers of some of which she appeared to have been fairly intimate. On Wednesday night, 6th of November 1912, I left Broughty Ferry for London with the object of interviewing all persons likely to afford information respecting the deceased and her movements. With the assistance of Chief Inspector Collins of the Criminal Investigation Department Scotland Yard, I obtained statements from all persons Miss Milne is known to have been acquainted with in London. I have submitted all these statements to the Procurator Fiscal. Interestingly, Charles Warner doesn't appear to be among those persons Miss Milne was known to have been acquainted with in London. So how does he come to be the prime suspect? On the 11th of November, 1912, while at Scotland Yard, I received from Superintendent Neves, Kent County Constabulary, Tonbridge, the following telephone message. We have a man in custody here for false pretenses who will be before the court tomorrow at 11.30 a.m. He gives the name of Charles Warner, 210 Wilton Avenue, Toronto, Canada. His description is age 38, 5 feet 9 inches, hair dark brown turning slightly grey, eyes grey, complexion pale or sallow, round featured, clean shaven, tattooed Masonic and odd fellow sign left forearm, gold stopping front teeth, dressed grey lounge suit, dark overcoat, skull cap, gentlemanly appearance. This man is a mystery to us and we thought perhaps he might be connected with the Dundee murder. Will you interview him? In consequence of this message, the following day, 12th of November 1912, I went to Tonbridge, Kent and was present during this man's trial on a charge of obtaining food and lodging by fraud. I had the man under observation during the whole of his trial, which lasted about an hour. Having satisfied myself that the man answered the description of the suspect seen at Broughty Ferry, I asked Superintendent Neves to instruct one of his men to have the prisoner's clothing examined with the view of finding bloodstains. Superintendent Neves gave instructions for this being done and it was shortly reported to us that a linen shirt which the prisoner had been wearing when he was remanded a week ago was now a missing and that Warner refused to say what had become of it. I telephoned the head warder at Maidstone Jail where the accused had been incarcerated during his remand and asked him to make inquiries about the shirt. Shortly afterwards, the head warder telephoned me saying that the shirt had been found in a corner of the dressing room in the prison, minus the cuffs, neckband and front. I afterwards obtained possession of this shirt produced. Superintendent Neves told me that the man in custody totally refused to give any account of himself beyond the fact that he had walked from London overnight 
with the intention of making his way to Dover for the purpose of getting a boat across to the continent. Superintendent Neves also mentioned that Warner had told the constable escorting him to prison that he had been recently in Scotland. Armed with that knowledge, Chief Constable Semple sets out to try and prove that Warner was the man seen in and around Elm Grove at the time of Jean Milne's murder. What that meant in practice for Semple was a lot of shoe leather, travelling, interviewing, searching for evidence and eyewitness testimony which could place Warner at the scene. In this fifth episode of the Inside Forensic Science podcast, we're going to consider what forensic science might offer in terms of placing a suspect at the scene. Here's Professor Neve McDade of the Levy Hume Research Centre for Forensic Science at the University of Dundee. One of the questions that we're often asked is around whether or not we can identify an individual that may have been present both at a crime scene or had some connectivity with that crime through whether it's biological traces or other sorts of traces of themselves that were left there. And that really brings a series of fundamental issues and questions that need to be addressed and need to be answered. And they depend upon whether or not you're looking at biometrics. So those are um, characteristics that are used to identify an individual person. So it might be fingerprints, it might be DNA, it might be dentition, so your, your, the way in which your teeth are formed, uh, or it might be other um, biological identifiers. And secondly, identifiers of physical things, so fibres, glass, paint, tool marks, and so on. So there's two different types of materials, firstly. For the purposes of this episode, we're going to focus on one biological identifier in particular, DNA. If this was a contemporary case, well, without doubt, the very first thing we'd be looking at is DNA. A DNA evidence really only became part of the forensic science toolbox in the mid-1980s. And that's not just in the UK, but globally. The UK led the development of um, what we now call a DNA fingerprinting in the mid-1980s. And it would be used in, it, it, well, it is used in almost every case that you can now imagine. And it would most certainly have been used in this case. And it would have been used, I think, in, in particular to try to examine for traces of potential perpetrators of this crime that, that uh, may be within the property, within the house that Jean Milne was found in. My name is Amanda Pirry. I'm the lead forensic scientist for Major Crime for the Scottish Police Authority Forensic Services. So DNA is a, a tool that we use within forensic science that we can test bodily fluids that have come from different people and allows us to be able to tell them apart. So a person's DNA is, in general terms, and most of the times is different from another person unless they are identical twins, that's the, the exception. So we can test samples that we've recovered from items that have been recovered from a crime scene and test them for blood, and we can test that blood for DNA and compare that uh, with profiles that we've obtained from known individuals that are involved in that investigation, which could be the victim, it could be a suspect, or it could be witnesses that have been somehow are involved or connected or witness to that incident. And we can then see if, if they match or if they're a potential contributor to that say we've got DNA from lots of different sources um, and see if, if they contributed to that mixture. So the first part is you need, to, you need to detect what it is that you're looking for. So you need to be able to identify the presence of it in the first place. So whether it's a fibre, a hair, a piece of glass, a fingerprint or DNA or whatever it might be. So we need some way of detecting this, these materials. And often that detection is by eye. Can we see it? Is, is there a way in which we can um, identify the presence of it, um, either by recovering uh, surface debris from materials like carpets or clothing, or can we swab a surface and take whatever the swab retains and then do an analysis of it? So we need some way of detecting and recovering materials. Let's revisit the crime scene with Police Sergeant Forbes, one of the first officers at the scene. If you've listened to the whole Inside Forensic Science podcast series so far, you'll be starting to get familiar with the scene. 
But this time, look at it through the eyes of the biologist looking for DNA. I found about two feet nine inches from the foot of the stair, Miss Milne lying on the carpet on the floor with her head towards the entrance, her feet towards the way leading towards the dining room. She was lying on her right side, her left arm lying across her right arm, stretched out in front of her body. Her clothes were all full of blood, a half cotton sheet doubled, uncovering her back and back of head. I saw at once decomposition had set in. On further examination, I found her legs were tied at the ankles with a green curtain rope. So what we'd be looking for in terms of evidence that would be biological of nature, that would contain DNA, so that tends to be bodily fluids such as blood, semen and saliva. Um, but in addition to that, that can be skin cells, you know, that have come from, potentially touched from our hands or hair that, um, from individuals. So this particular incident involving Jean Milne um, was a physical assault. So she had bleeding injuries. So we have blood uh, at the scene from the deceased, from Jean. A patch of blood on carpet on the floor to the left of the stair. A large pool of blood about 18 inches to the south of the body in direct line with where her head was lying opposite the drawing room. A small blood stain near the drawing room door. There is sometimes the potential during that struggle or altercation that the, the perpetrator may have also become injured. So we're looking to see at the scene is there any evidence of that having happened. The half cotton sheet produced number 28 that was partly covering her body and head had some spots of blood thereon. Chief Constable Semple found towel produced number 29 in scullery of kitchen. This towel had one spot of blood thereon and was slightly discoloured as if it had been used to dry some person's hands. How the injuries have been um, sustained, what's created those injuries, are we, is it a blunt force trauma? So have it, is it used a heavy object to strike a person, a strike gene to, to create those bleeding injuries? So in this case, there is a number of potential weapons uh, at the scene that would be considered. Stone produced number 24 was found lying inside door of cloakroom and has the appearance that part of it had been broken off recently, but no blood stains thereon. A number of broken pieces of stone produced number 25, similar to production number 24, were found lying scattered about the main hall. Some items that could potential weapons and are noted to be blood stained. There's some blunt force type weapons such as the poker, could these, these would be considerations. So they would have the potential not only to examine for transfer of genes, blood to them, if they've been, if she's been struck multiple times and she started to bleed, but also the person that has wielded that weapon, struck her, could their DNA be on the handle or parts of those uh, items that we would they be able to examine, detect and compare against known samples or used to um, interrogate our DNA databases that we have available to us now but weren't available then. We'll come back to the issue of databases because it's an important one. Even with an untrained eye, as you read through the productions list in the evidence files, the potential for recovery of DNA starts to jump out at you. Take this curious entry in the productions list for example. Flower vase, which was standing on a second step of back stair and had been full of urine. The past tense suggests someone had emptied it, not realising, of course, that over a century later, the vase might yield a vital biological clue. So when you examine a crime scene, so you're looking for, you know, what would be related to the incident? Are there things within the scene that are a bit out the ordinary, that stand out? You, you might not be able to tell that or have that information. Depends on, you know, the friends, the people that know um, Jean Milne. If if that was unusual, that they, you know, that that wasn't um, normal at that even at that time. And so, therefore, if it wasn't um, normal or it stands out, then yes, most definitely we could examine that um, urine 
um, which urine is mostly composed of water, but it will also have a certain um, number of cells within it as it as it sloughed off um, passes through the urethra. Um, it, cells will be carried along with the, the urine, and yes, that we would be able to then test those few cells that may be present within that that urine and determine who it may have come from if we've got samples to compare to or if we if they were on a, a DNA database that we could use um, to identify them, yes. We'll never unravel the mystery of the vase of urine. It remains one of the many curiosities of the Jean Milne case. Since its emergence in the 1980s, DNA analysis has become so sophisticated that you don't even need to be able to see the sample you're working with. So often what we are sampling um, or testing is not even visible to the naked eye. We are back in the day, probably back in the, 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 the late 1980s, we were looking um, to test stains that were as blood stains that are as big as a 50 pence piece, as an example. You, you need still quite a lot of samples, something that was visible. But now we are testing samples that you, you don't even need to see the blood. It could have been wiped, washed away. It's, you know, we're talking trace levels. So yes, um, very little indeed now we can generate profiles from that could be um, utilised and compared to um, other known samples. So very, very little. Which begs the question, how do you find and sample something you can't see? So our examinations will begin very much on a, a visual examination, just by the naked eye. We might use additional torches, lights, to as part of that examination. Um, we might use specialist lights. So those are tools we have that are non-destructive. We can go into a scene with these specialist lights but not lose, disturb or destroy any evidence. So once we've done that visual examination, we might take samples from those stains but we might be looking um, for um, other evidence other than what's visible. So if this was a sexual assault, we would have to use other tools to determine if, if there was a um, semen within the scene. And those tend to be a chemical tests that we will then start to use. If we can't visibly see the stains, we'll start to screen areas, um, small areas with using these chemical tests. And if semen is found, these are presumptive tests, then we might get a colour reaction that indicates that that bodily fluid may be present, um, but we can't see it um, um, just by the naked eye. And that's, we could target those areas and take samples and then take those back to the laboratory to do further confirmatory tests um, to confirm the presence of that bodily fluid. Coming back to blood, if maybe that blood is maybe dilute, washed away, or maybe the colour of the surfaces within that scene make finding blood difficult, um, a little bit more challenging. The, again, we can use other chemical tests to be able to look for those traces. And again, if, the, if it's present, these tests will highlight that in a sort of colour reaction. The, obviously, the, the most well-known one, um, as everybody watches CSI, is when that um, the, the blood will, um, the chemical reaction will fluoresce, emit some light, and you get that lovely sort of blue colour that we see on um, various television programmes that everybody is familiar with. So there's there's different types of tests and tools that we can use to look for those traces if it's not readily apparent um, by the naked eye. We now have become so good at the recovery of DNA that we can recover DNA from samples as small as a single cell. And the consequence of that is that instead of recording now or recovering single DNA profiles, we end up with complex mixtures of DNA. And so unmixing those is challenging uh, in terms of just working out whose DNA might be present. Even if the DNA of somebody is present, we still need to understand quite a lot about what that might mean. We're going to step away from the subject of DNA temporarily to hear from Professor Neve Dade about databases, because it's a really important part of the necessary steps to identifying a sample from a scene. Once we have detected it, we need to be able to recognise what it is. And recognition of materials requires really the creation of what we call um, a ground truth data set. So that's a set of data 
that we know the provenance of, so we know where it's come from. And by creating such a ground truth data set, it enables us to have confidence that we can identify what it is that we're looking at. So if you use the example of fibres, if I want to know how to characterise a fibre, um, to, to say whether it's natural, wool, cotton, something like that, or whether it's synthetic, nylon, polyester, and so on, then I need to get known examples of those fibres, and I need to measure them with my equipment, and I need to be able to say this is what it looks like under these measurement conditions. And so then I can, I can whatever I find in my crime scene, then I can make a reasonable determination of what it is that I'm looking at. So the building of data sets for the purposes of characterization of things is really important. And that's a, a lot of the uh, research community's work is around that area. When we're looking at identifying people, then the main types of biometrics that are used in forensic science are fingerprints and DNA. Now, here we do have databases and we have very large databases of um, fingerprints and equally of DNA. The fingerprint databases were started back around 1912. Similarly for DNA, we have a national DNA database in the United Kingdom and most countries around the world have such databases. Charles Warner, the main suspect in the Gene Milne case, was already in prison. So had DNA sampling and analysis been available in 1912, it's reasonable to assume that either his DNA would have been on a database or that police could have taken a sample for comparison. As it was in 1912, with no fingerprints for useful comparison, the Broughty Ferry Police did send off a print for analysis, but it was not deemed to have any clearly defined characteristics, the investigation team had to work with eyewitness testimony. Here's what the evidence of identification on page two of the files says. John Wood from Broughty Ferry identifies Warner as calling at Elm Grove on the 17th of September. Jesse McIntosh and Ina McIntosh identify Warner as leaving Elm Grove on the 7th of October. Jack Duncan, Alexander Potter and Henry Bannerman see a man entering the grounds at 7.30 on a night around the 14th or 15th of October. Potter says Warner is the man. Others cannot say definitely, but think he is the man they saw. James Don sees Warner leaving Elm Grove on the 16th of October. James Malcolm sees Warner enter a car in Broughty Ferry on the 16th of October. Margaret Campbell sees a man walking in the grounds of Elm Grove on the 15th of October, thinks Warner is the man. Annie Little speaks to a man calling at the post office in Broughty Ferry asking for Elm Grove. She thinks Warner is the man but can't swear to it. James Delaney and Thomas Smeaton cannot say whether Warner is the man. John Alfred Wright, a hairdresser in Dundee, took a moustache off a man at 9am on Monday about the middle of October, cannot say definitely Warner is the man. So a number of witnesses do seem to identify Warner, but remember those eyewitnesses were remembering back to someone they'd seen perhaps only once and a month earlier. How good would you be at identifying a stranger you'd seen several weeks ago for a brief time? How sure can we be that it was Warner? Even if DNA evidence had been available in 1912 and Warner's DNA had been identified at the scene, that wouldn't have necessarily meant he was there. Only that his DNA was there. No longer do we just need a database of individuals where the DNA can be compared to. We also need to start to understand how did the DNA get there. So it's no longer a question of source for DNA samples. It's a question of activity. So how did it get there? What causes DNA to move between two people? What causes DNA to move between an object and a person or a person and an object? And how long does it stay there for? So that whole process of the transfer, persistence and background abundance of DNA becomes absolutely critical to the understanding of the meaning, the value of that piece of evidence. So there is some research that has been done looking at transfer um, and the ways that DNA or uh, bodily fluids that we can get DNA from can transfer. Um, for example, we know that uh, different individuals will shed their DNA in different ways and at different rates. So some people will transfer their DNA more readily than others. Um, so there's terms that maybe people have heard of as that they're poor shedders, where 
they, they maybe don't readily leave their DNA, particularly if they pick up an item and touch it. Well, we always detect their DNA if we were to examine and sample it, and sometimes maybe we, we won't. Some people share DNA more readily than others. Um, in addition, we know that it's possible for a person to transfer their DNA onto objects, or we find their DNA on objects that they haven't directly handled or touched. So that DNA is transfer transferred through intermediary objects. So if I give a scenario is that if, if a person was to shake hands with another individual, so there will be a transfer of each other's DNA onto their hands, and then if one of those individuals then subsequently touched a door handle, they may leave not only some of their own DNA, but DNA from the person that they shook hands with. And then if we were to come along and then swab, take samples from that door handle, we may detect DNA from both those people. Um, but does that mean that, that both those individuals touched that door handle? And the answer to that is not necessarily. So we know that it's possible to transfer our DNA indirectly from onto objects. And that's something that as a forensic scientist, we have to be very careful about when we interpret our DNA evidence. However, DNA is hugely informative. It does have its limitations. Just because we get a DNA profile um, and it matches an individual, we can't necessarily say when that DNA was deposited. We might not be able to say what that DNA has come from. But what it can tell us is that it can tell us um, who it might match, it can tell us if they're male or female. It can be used to identify individuals through their uh, familial relationships. It can tell us, you know, how much DNA there. Is it from potentially from a touch or is it looks like it's come from a rich source such as a bodily fluid? So sometimes that can be a matter of opinion. But it depends on what we're testing. So if we have done other tests, so we've got a blood stain, so we, that informs us that the DNA profile we've got is from blood. If that blood stain has been taken from a pattern where that pattern is indicative of maybe um, a stamping or a punching, somebody's been physically assaulted, then that allows us to give some information about the activity about what has happened, how has that blood got there, and not only who it came from. DNA is part of a, 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 a toolbox of many things that a scientist has available to them to help them to, to um, investigate and support the police in their investigation. And because it is such a powerful tool, it's also allowing police to revisit cold cases. Alex Prentice QC. In particular, there has been a, a recent case which involved a murder that some 36 years ago in which a ligature was discovered with a knot which had not been untied since it was discovered. Over the years, DNA detection techniques were applied, but they were not so sensitive as to pick up anything of value. However, more recently, the knot was unfolded and a DNA hit or match was found and that linked to a person who was subsequently convicted. So there's no doubt that this is the single most uh, significant advance in this area for, for many years. So were the productions from the Jean Milne case still to be available, does Amanda Peary think, even after a century, we could get a DNA profile from them? Packaged and stored correctly under the right conditions, then the potential to go back and examine them decades, hundreds of years later is huge um, because that, that evidence will still be there. It's unless they've been destroyed or they've not been kept uh, appropriately, um, then we, we would still be able to go back, find that blood staining, take samples, take samples for DNA and test them. Without a doubt, yes, this, the case of Jean Mill had would have huge potential for us to go back and do that, just like any cold case that we go back and reinvestigate. Um, obviously, it would come down to really if, if this person was known to Jean, um, if you had you know, samples for comparison, 
or those databases if he was particularly a repeat offender um, and therefore that was there a chance that he is on a database or is this you know his you know first time you know so I think there would be no it would have been um, if this was a cold case then I would be very um, excited if you like about the potential of the things that we could examine if those productions still existed with the tools that we've got uh, today yeah most definitely. In our final episode of Inside Forensic Science, we'll be reviewing the evidence against Charles Warner and considering the role of the forensic scientist in the courtroom. Scientific evidence is always circumstantial. We very, very, very rarely have the smoking gun. And I think that would be the case in this, in this case, is that there's lots of circumstantial evidence. Is it enough to convict? Well, that's a matter for the jury, not a matter for a scientist. I have to say, I do feel sorry for people who sit on juries because the amount of information that they have to process. There is always a, a danger of what is sometimes termed the white coat syndrome, that uh, someone comes in with a string of qualifications and experience and speaks of highly technical scientific matters, that the risk is that the jury just simply follow that and accept it without question. In episode five of Inside Forensic Science, the readings were by Andrew Thompson, David Stenhouse and Mark Stephen. The researcher was Heather Duran and the consultant was Pauline Mack. The narrator was me, Penny Latin. Inside Forensic Science is an adventurous audio limited production for the Leverhulme Research Centre for Forensic Science at the University of Dundee, funded by the Leverhulme Trust.